Hey, what's up? How's it going, everyone? This is the Go Long Podcast. I'm Tyler Dunn here with Jim Monis, remotely. We were just saying how much we wish we were Hamburg Brewing, our loyal sponsor here in Hamburg, New York. Get on in, get your Hoptimoniums, your Louis, your little bit lager nows. Everything's uh, looking great there at Hamburg. But Jim, how's life? What's new? Yeah, nothing new. I, I miss I miss Hamburg already. I mean, we had a nice little routine going. Like you said, it's a nice a lunchtime beer, a lunchtime beef on wax, some football <laughs> talk. That's kind of been our style. So this is good, though. It's okay. I'm excited for this weekend. Um, we got a pretty unwatchable game tonight with the injuries to Cleveland and Denver tonight. But um, I always like when the Thursday night football just gets you back, you know, gets you ready for the weekend. I mean, it was masterful on the NFL's part, right? Was it 06 it started, I want to say? Like, let's just drop a football game in on a Thursday. We care about player safety. Don't get us wrong. Like, we, oh, yeah. we don't, you know, we really want your bodies to recover. And, you know, we are looking after our players. But, you know, if you played on Sunday, yeah, a few days later, here, here's the game. But, but you're right. It's because, I mean, I look forward to it. Like, oh, otherwise, there's nothing going on. Maybe you're watching a little basketball, a little hockey. But... A foot, an NFL game. It's it's become so commonplace now that we forget why the NFL put it in. I mean, it's an addiction, right? They're, they're, the the league we're, we're addicted to the product, and we want more yeah. of it. They'd have it every and, day if they could. And think about like in college football, how the MAC conference, you know, got really smart, and now everybody. I mean, we look forward to their Tuesday, Wednesday games during the week now. You know, late in their conference games, so we're all addicted to gambling football whatever we're addicted to when it's one game on a tuesday wednesday third like this game tonight is it's almost like a preseason team for the browns tonight they have so many injuries we don't even know who's playing yet yet bernie kozar is gonna dust it, it off it, you know it's gonna be what it's gonna be it's gonna be watched it's gonna be bet on because it's the only it's the only thing going right Right. Everybody bitches about the Jaguars on Thursday night, you know, wearing those, uh, those hideous yeah, yeah. jerseys like they did for a while. And then everybody watches, everybody does. Cause they, they plugged, uh, you know, Allen Robinson and Allen Hearns into their fantasy team. So <laughs> they got to watch, got to watch. Um, yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting. Uh, today we're going to have LaVon Kirkland. I'm really pumped uh, for this That's conversation. Cool. Yeah. I mean, we, we both, and, and sorry, that's, uh, my daughter on the monitor. We're keeping an eye on her. She's just reading her book right now in the crib. So we're getting there. A strong nap. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But, you know, I think we both agree the golden age for this league, this sport was the mid to late nineties. Right. I mean, that's speaking of getting addicted to this league. I mean, that, that was when I I fell in love with all things football and I think a LeVon Kirkland, I think a Greg Lloyd, Kevin Green, Chad Brown, and these Steeler defenses that that were just belligerent. They just wanted to take your head off. And and Kirkland, I mean, he was like 280 in the middle of that defense, just blasting people. It'll be, I mean, I want to look back at, at, at that era with him a little bit and, and really get his perspective on these Steelers because he's, you know, he, he's a great analyst now. Um, you know, he, he went to Clemson, so he, I, I believe he covers Clemson, uh, but definitely still watches the Steelers pretty regularly. Oh, I didn't know he was covering Clemson. Does he do radio? Yes, I believe he's on the radio program down there, right? I mean, that's we should have, yeah, we should that, have that at the tip of I our tongue. I want to talk to him. You know, he played for the Eagles. His last year was in Philly. I was an area yeah. scout. And we had him and Jeremiah Trotter. You want to talk about just downhill, ferocious, like... So it's, it's amazing that, like... And Kirkland was... I mean, he could move. That's the thing. I mean, he was massive. I mean, he looked like a defensive lineman, but he could right. move. Like he, he could, could move. he could carry the he tight end down the seam. I mean, he did. Uh, but yeah, that'll be a lot of fun. And I, I just think this week is a good opportunity to kind of take a look at what we wrote at Go Long. I mean, you wrote on it last week in the Monus Report, or maybe it was two weeks ago, and I wrote on it uh, this week. But you know, we agree way too much. I, th- I think it's time yeah. for us to disagree a little bit. I mean, you're a nice yeah. guy, but we gotta we gotta crack some skulls here and, and go at it. So I, you know, when it comes to the Steelers and direction and philosophy, maybe there's some areas where we probably agree. But um, maybe and if folks didn't read it, I I get it. It was an ugly game against Seattle. Really ugly. If you stayed up for that, 
<laughs> God bless you. You probably did too, right? As like we're saying here. We did. Uh, I, I get it though. Like I do get Pittsburgh rolling out Ben Roethlisberger at 39 for one more season. More so because of the philosophy on, on trying to sell that you're winning now. Right. I, I, if, if, so if you don't go with Ben Roethlisberger, what are your options? Do you start Mason Rudolph and just lose this year? Do you, you bring, find Duck Hodges? I have no idea where Duck Hodges is these days. Dwayne Haskins. Do you uh, just reach into that Kmart bargain bin for somebody else? Do you draft Davis Mills and, and trot him out there like Houston? Like, they didn't want to do that stuff because, and we'll ask LeVon about this. I mean, Pittsburgh, this is something they've built up for three decades strong, really. And I, I hate using the word culture and process and foundation. I feel too often it's, you know, it's like a kindergarten teacher there. You know, yeah. it, it's, it's cliche drivel that doesn't mean anything. You want talent. But, but, but I, th- there, there is a place for it. I mean, what Pittsburgh has built there is different from Bill Cower to Mike Tomlin, where practices, it's like a rite of passage. It's, it's this war of attrition. I mean, they're beating the hell out of each other in training camp. They hit more than anybody else. Um, the language they use with each other, Vince Williams really got into this is, is belligerent. I mean, they're, they're mean to each other. They want that cream to rise to the crop. That's why guys are homegrown. That's why a guy like, um, you know, Joey Porter, I think he had to wait his turn. James Harrison, he waited like four years to get his turn. It's, it's just different in Pittsburgh. And you don't want to just cash in on a season. It's what they did in 2019. Ben Roethlisberger breaks his thumb and everybody writes them off for the season. Most teams, when they lose their quarterback, they're done. I mean, you're just done. And they traded a first round pick for Mika Fitzpatrick. They are fighting for a playoff spot in week 17. So I, I think that that philosophy and making it clear to everybody in the building, like we're trying to win now in the front office, and in the coaching staff on the field everywhere trumps all and people might be saying oh well then why is ben roethlisberger dead last on the eye in the sky monus quarterback ring right he's not playing well but i think all right then what's the option what should they have done you know i mean if they didn't if they didn't identify a franchise quarterback this offseason why force it right why force it maybe maybe next offseason aaron Rodgers. he's winking with mike tomlin during the game you know smiling at each other maybe a, a quarterback wants to go to you because of what you've built for three decades, right? Good defense receivers, the best coach in the NFL, because of that, a quarterback wants to go for you. So I just think if they would have just given up on Ben Roethlisberger scrambled with whatever they could have scrambled with you, you risk uh, throwing all of this away. No, I agree with you. If you don't have the plan in place, that's what I wrote about. If you don't have the plan in place, like pre-draft where free agency you don't have somebody you target draft. We don't have the capital. We don't, we don't like any of these quarterbacks to go with. Okay. Then Ben's your best option. So they are, I think what they're doing right now is what coaching is. They are making the most of what their talent, you know, what their team says they can do. Unbelievable defense, which that's what they always have, right? Tomlin Steelers. That's what they do. They're not running the ball. Well, I mean, they're 29th running the offense right now. I mean, it's like, that's what, you know, they drafted a first round running back who obviously he's a battering ram. We watch him play. I mean, he's, he runs hard, but they can't even run the ball right now. He can't throw the ball. I don't know where they're trying. I don't know what they're trying to do this year, especially when you watch the Mahomes, the Allens, the Lamar Jacksons, this is the AFC, the Herbert, the Burroughs. He's not even in their class. And that's five guys right there in, the, in his own conference. We're not even talking about the NFC. So are you trying to win 10 games, sneak in the playoffs, be one and done? Okay, great job. I mean, it really is a great job. Like, he's a hell of a coach. We I'm saying that. that's, a good, that's a good thing. You're maintaining what you've done. You've, you've done a great job. You've done a great yeah. job. But, you know, you, you're, I think you're kidding yourself if you think this team's even – there's no way they're, to me, even – competing for a super bowl well they waltzed like, into a high mark stadium in yeah. western new york and took it to josh allen's buffalo bills it's great i mean they, they've what can you say about mike tomlin and the fact that they no, won that's that what game I'm saying. yes go ahead and give him coach if they make the playoffs coach of the year all that he deserves all that i mean he is a great coach i'm not and i'm just saying 
that he's doing what coaches do. And, and that's what's so impressive about them. And they don't, and the, I, what I love too about the Steelers is they don't make excuses. They don't sit there and try to say, they don't even try to act like Ben's playing. I mean, Ben even, Ben admits he has to play, but you know, he says it, but it, it's, you know, what are you going to do after this year? That's, that's the next part. I mean, and like you said, it's not going to be hard to get a quarterback to want to go there. That defense is young and ready and, and prime. And the offense, to be honest, the offense is pretty much put together. They just don't have, you know, I just don't think Ben's good enough to get them to where they want to go, especially against the competition. If you were to catch Tomlin and Colbert and everybody in charge there in an honest, in an honest moment, I, I wonder what March was like for Pittsburgh because they kind of hemmed and hawed a little bit. And maybe – they were trying to think of other options. They had to have been thinking of other options out of that wild they card loss. And, and they just realized, okay, well, even if we wanted an Aaron Rodgers, like Green Bay has all the leverage there. And Deshaun Watson became Deshaun Watson. We see that. They, Russell Wilson, you know, there was a lot of discontent there that kind of sorted itself out. And in the draft, they weren't going to have a shot at one of those top guys with where they were picking. I mean, they started, they, they did start the season, what, 11 and 0 with Ben Roethlisberger. He did throw for 4,000 yards, 33 touchdowns. So you, you can talk yourself into one more run. I, I get that. I really do. You know, maybe their problem was the offensive line. They, they completely retooled that a lot of new faces and it hasn't really worked out in the run game. Um, I don't know. I think that they can get to 21 points. I think they've got studs on defense and TJ Watt, Minka Fitzpatrick, Cam, Cam Hayward, and they can, they can figure out a way to get to 10, 11 wins. And I, I get that logic. I mean, we, we, you lived in that world where it's like, okay, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? But I feel like Pittsburgh, it's a little different because they, that's decades in the making what they have. Right. I mean, you guys came in, you're trying to build something. Yeah, it's out of thin way, air. Right. I mean, the a culture of losing in Buffalo um, yeah, that you're trying to change. What, yeah, what they're doing is different, obviously, because they're, they're, they had, I mean, Ben is, I mean, the cornerstone of the, the franchise. And the GM, Kevin Colbert, it's pretty much not a secret. He's going to step down. As soon as Ben retires, Colbert's retired. And you're going to see a new regime come in, and, or however they're, they'll promote from within. But that's probably going to happen after this season. So I think they're all looking at this as, hey, here's our last run. How can we max out what Ben can do right now? Because we know we have – they have a Super Bowl caliber defense. I mean, that's not that's not a joke. Or at least playoff caliber for sure. Those young guys are going to get better too. Yeah. The coaching will yeah. – you know, I know they got gashed by Alex Collins, but those young players, Highsmith, James Pierre. That was surprising. Pierre, that Sutton. was surprising they came – like – how that half because it's not like they the Seattle was threatening throwing the ball you know it's like I was surprised they were gashing them like that yeah I mean it was the zombie Seahawks for a while I mean the first half they didn't even that look was, like a functioning team and for the Alex first half. Collins looks terrible to me like he was wrong I mean those that was all the Seattle offensive line I mean he was like hmm. he looked slow and straight line I mean he wasn't I mean that's what he is anyway but he wasn't he wasn't it, you could put anybody back there they would have got those yards I think um, just to see Seattle dominate up front like that coming out of the half was surprising. It was, I, yeah, it'll be interesting to see Pittsburgh. So they've got the bye week and then they come back against Cleveland. They've got two really winnable games after that. They could easily be six and three going into the teeth Cleveland's of their schedule. Yeah. Well, so yeah, I hear you. And that's, well, it's never that easy. Yeah. Like just looking ahead like that. It's especially if you're not scoring it. They, they have at some point that's scary. That means every game's going to be, if you're not scoring, that means you're going to, every game could go a lot of different ways. You know, when you think about all these teams right now, there's like five, I want to say five teams averaging over 30 a game. Yeah. You know, that's. They the might just have Orleans, to, I'm sorry, Jim, go ahead. No, I was just going to say the year we won the Super Bowl in New Orleans, like I was pointing out, we were the, we averaged like 32 a game, but we were the only team over 30 that year. Now there's like five teams. So it's, yeah, the, the bar has been raised scoring points. I do wonder this bye week, you know, is there this um, heart to heart conversation b between Roethlisberger and Matt Canada? And they just say, all right, this whole idea of running the football, trying to beat our heads against the wall, it's, it's not working. I guess, you know, they've kind of been, 
their commitment's kind of been hot and cold, but do they just go back to that quick passing game from last year and just try to throw it 40 times a game because they can't run the ball that well? They might. I mean, they've got the receivers to, to do it. They and, do. and they do like do the RPO stuff with Roethlisberger. They I mean, do. he can, he can play that kind of quick game. Uh, I don't know. They might, they, they might, they're going to have to do something over this bye week. Yeah. They have to change something up. I think on that offense, just it's, it's almost on, it's really unwatchable. I mean, it's strange and he's not giving guys chances either. I mean, his downfield throws are like, I mean, he's off target a lot. Yeah. So it's just, it's a mix of things right now for them on offense, but that's what I love about defense. It keeps you in every single game. I love the, the attention to detail. I mean, you can, you can see why Mike Tomlin loses his mind on the officials with how they screwed them over at the end of the game. I mean, DK Metcalf just inexplicably try, stays in bounds. Like, what are you thinking, DK Metcalf? That, that was strange. That was like, strange. So you watched it. So you tell me, Jim, because I was messaging with a, with a reader on this. Yeah. DK Metcalf fumbles the ball, right? right. And right. It's, a, it's a clear fumble. So, you know, they, they blow it. I mean, they, whatever they said, they, they have to review it. So they reward them the three seconds. Now, if they, if it is what it is, it's a fumble and Seattle's trying to rush to the line to get, do they even get a playoff? I mean, that's probably it, right? If, and that's what Tom was saying, correct? Yeah. Like, that's, why what was, that's what I believe he, that's was what saying. he was saying. I don't see how you get it off. Right. To Tomlin's point, I get it. Um, but it also seemed, ex- it, they seem to explain it on TV. Correct. I mean, it seemed like they did it correctly. You know, after it was all said and done, I felt like I agreed with how they explained it. But I also see what Tomlin's saying. Like, there was no need for any of that. If if you didn't, if you said it was a fumble, let's go. And, and in addition to that, like they give them the three seconds as opposed to yeah. one second, where they might not have even been able to get the snap off with the it's one second because everybody has to be set. Kill it. Right, right. It's um. It was a strange he, ending. But that's why I love a coach like Tomlin. I mean, here here's a dude in James Pierre, a corner, kind of been up and down early this season. I mean, he had the big punch out on Emmanuel Sanders. He had a, the, the play in the end zone to win the game against Denver. And he's gotten kind of beat in between, but he's the one who forces that fumble. And yeah. so you can see our, here's a guy that's homegrown undrafted second year, like Steelers through and through makes the play to win the game by punching it out. And they get screwed by the officials. I, I just feel like the Steelers are always going to kind of make those type of plays that other teams just aren't going to make. It's not going to be pretty. It's going to be grimy. Yeah. But they're in a better state than, say, Cleveland right now. Cleveland is, like I said, they are, I don't even know what they're going to put out there tonight, but they are banged up bad. So it's, it, it mean, it, this early in the season, too, it's injuries, injuries, penalties and injuries are just incredible in the NFL right now. Like, how do you stay healthy? And these games are just, they're becoming so hard to watch because of all the penalties. It's just. All right. With that, we'll we'll definitely have to pick up the officiating too, because I mean, the officiating has has been God awful, but uh, we've got LeVon. He's waiting. Yes. To to chat. So let's, uh, let's bring him on in here. All right. We've got the, uh, the legend LeVon Kirkland with us now. (laughs) Great to see you, man. Um, Got it. And like I just told you, I had, had so much fun talking to you. I believe it was like last November, December about those, right. uh, those Steeler glory days and just how you become a linebacker in that defense. But I think everybody that hears your name, I mean, maybe their the hair kind of stands up on the back of their neck or they get chills or goosebumps. <laughs> it's, right. You want to talk about a violent, belligerent defense. Um, two-time All-Pro two-time Steelers team MVP, all decade team in the nineties on all American at Clemson. Before that you spent, I believe nine seasons with the Steelers. Yes. Nine seasons. And uh, one year in Seattle, one year in Philly. How in the hell are you, man? Great to see you. Oh yeah, man. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. How are you guys doing? We're doing good. We're doing good. good. Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, usually we're drinking a little beer talking football. We do it at a brewery, but um, had to go remote mm-hmm. this time. So a little coffee, you know, a little coffee. I get it. I understand. <laughs> I understand. I, I do the vanilla latte. So I'm not, <laughs> I, I'm not, you know, just drinking it all black or sugar or cream, <laughs> but I do like the vanilla lattes. They're very good. So 
I like and, and green tea, you know, you get to be my age, you got to start reversing <laughs> what you put in your mouth. So I do, I do more green tea now, man. Hey, well, Levon, yes, sir. I lived, uh, I lived nine years down in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Okay. So, yeah. I don't know if you ever get down there much, but that's like my favorite place in the world. So I it, it is a really good spot. I went there this summer. Actually, I've been there twice this year, um, at Folly Beach. Yeah, that's where I just yeah. was. Yeah, Folly Beach. Yeah, it was nice. It's a lot of food there, man. You got to be careful. Got to be careful. That's true. Yeah, you're going to gain weight on a, on a weekend trip down there. You're gaining weight. Uh, no question about it. No question about it. I didn't have any green tea. I can promise you that. I'm sure you didn't. You had you had a tea, but it was it called, wasn't quite green. It's either called sweetened tea. It's either uh, called firefly tea. Right. <laughs> yes, what, indeed. What's life like for you today, Levon? I know you've come over to the dark side with us on the media a little bit. Um, you just yeah, said you keep in touch bit, with your yeah. teammates. Uh, I'm doing the Believe podcast, which talks about clips in football. And, you know, this year has been... In, an adventure actually so yeah doing that i'm also going back to school i'm getting my master's in psychology uh you know a few things on board uh uh believe it or not i'm i'm writing a book <laughs> so, so that's that's a lot of fun a lot of work so yeah i'm, I'm my, my plate is pretty busy and i'm working and i'm with the south carolina football hall of fame that's right. Which we aim to educate, empower, and encourage. Our, our students in South Carolina are ranked 43rd in the nation as far as college and career readiness. Uh, that's a problem. And we are, our goal is to be in the top 10 in 2030. So it's a, it's a goal. I'm telling you, that's a huge goal. <laughs> Good for you. That that's amazing. Um, can you, can you talk about the book? Is it about yourself? Is it, you know, yeah, well, uh, actually, it's a it's a book. It's a thank you book, and the thank you book is just writing letters to different people, places, and experience that I, I'm thankful for. So, for the first one I wrote, and I was just writing this. It's called Dear Draft, and it kind of goes back, and I'm talking to the draft like it's a person, and I'm talking about my experience that day and getting drafted by the Pittsburgh Steelers at 38th pick. And I put it out there on Facebook and, you know, one of my sisters was like, you know what, you need to probably write a book. You know, this is really good. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. You know, I, you know, maybe I, I don't really consider myself a writer. I'm more so, more so a storyteller more than anything. I, I don't, you know, I'm not wearing the jacket with the patch on there. I'm not going out to the woods and <laughs> and typing and being alone is, you know, it's just, I, sometimes I, I wake up or I just start thinking about, oh, I can, I can say thank you to this. So I said, you know, it's a Pittsburgh Steelers course. I did a thank you to, uh, uh, I probably do a thank you to Coach Cower um, individually. I did a thank you to Chad, Greg, and Kevin. That was on Facebook as well. So that's that's one of the books and the other book is run bonnie run my nickname in when i was little was bonnie because my sister who's two years older than me angela could not say the b sound so she would say laban she would say laban laban so my mother's like just call him bond but she's only two years old so i get it and so she was like bond and so my nickname my nickname for a long time was bonnie so I, I talk about I talk about my imagination as a 11 year old that uh, knew he was going to play in the NFL, and we go from there. So you you mentioned catching up with with Greg and Chad. Um, when you really look back at what you guys built in in Pittsburgh, that defense, that three four Blitzburg, what do you take the most pride in, and, and what made that group special? Oh, I, I just thought we were just innovative. I mean, uh, we weren't the first team to run a 3-4, but I thought what we did was unique in a lot of ways. And I, I'm not sure if there were four better backers in a 3-4 scheme. And, you know, we were, all, we, we were all different, but we were all the same in a lot of ways. Uh, 
Greg was, he was the explosive mean guy from the outside. Didn't take any junk from anybody. And, you know, he was out of all those guys on that team. He was probably the alpha male. Yeah. He was the alpha male. I mean, he walked around with his shirt off most of the time. He had that, he had that one t-shirt and said he wouldn't hire for the disposition. So Greg was just, uh, Greg was a player, man. I love Greg Lloyd to me was one of the best players that I've ever played with. And he brought an energy and a passion and an intensity to the game that if you didn't get on board, then he'll just call you out and be like, don't put him back on the field. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it was like that. It was funny. And then, you, you know, you look on the other side, there was Kevin and Kevin came in my second year, my first year starting. And we just had a bond, me and Kevin. And Kevin was a, a great pass rusher. He just knew how to get to the quarterback. Uh, just, and I think our scheme helped him a lot get back, getting back there. But um, he he was a crafty veteran. He understood who he was playing against, quarterbacks he was playing against, and uh, it was a lot of fun playing with Kevin. And then Chad, the guy that was <laughs> beside me, it was kind of funny because we were both kind of green. Our first year starting. So if you were running something like a sweep or something straightforward, you had no chance. But if you ran anything like a power or a counter where you're going one way, then you're going the other way, we had problems sometimes. We <laughs> we did because we both never we we didn't we didn't play inside linebacker. We never played it um, until yeah. we got to Pittsburgh. So it was a learn. I mean, we, it took us. I, I think. We played good because we were really good athletes, you know, and we were decent. We were decent that first year, but that second and third year, man, we really, really turned it on. We did. And we became um, just as valuable. And then, you, I mean, you got four guys who can make plays and then you're blitzing us a lot. And the cool thing too, was we all wore 90 numbers that front seven. Yeah. So I think it kind of confuses confused the offensive lineman we were dropping off you know joel steed our nose guard would drop into coverage our ends would drop into coverage we would you know we would cross each other we brought guys from the outside so it was a lot of fun to play it really was and and at first man everybody was playing um, under center so it was a disadvantage for the yeah. offense it really was it took it took people a while to catch up and i look at the things we did People are still doing it today where the linebackers are, are walking up and they're sugaring the guards. That's the kind of stuff we did before anybody else did. So that influence is still on the game. And we spent a little time uh, talking about that war of attrition in, in Pittsburgh and, and why it's just different and how it's built up over time, you know, one team to the next, to the next. And it, and it really is about that linebacker position. And, if, if people call it the story that we had to go along last year on Vince Williams and, you know, Blitzberg mm -hmm. and the history, they might've, they might remember this, but you've got to tell the story on the podcast of uh, being a rookie, right? It was in 92 when you hurt your wrist and, yes. Gr and Greg, <laughs> he knew you were hurting that. You mentioned it. And then yeah, something you know, got to happen there. You know, I'm a naive rookie at the time. It, well, and, and, you know, I've, it's, it's the playoff time, really. And my, I hurt my wrist when we played Green Bay, but, you know, I kind of gutted it through. And, <laughs> you know, it was just one practice. We were, you know, practicing the playoffs. We weren't going to play that week. We are going to play the next week. And so I'm like, man, my wrist is really bothering me. It's cold. You know, no indoor facility now. You got to know that we're, we're in the elements. We're out there in the cold. It's freezing outside. And I'm like, man, my wrist is hurting. And Greg was like, let me, hey, Rook, let me see your wrist. And I showed him my wrist and he chopped down on it. And I felt so much pain. I almost went down on my knees, but I didn't. So I go to John Norwick and I like, hey, Wick, man, I, I think I broke, I say, I think I broke my wrist. He kind of looks at it with really no concern. And he's like, well, just practice. Um, just go, go through practice with an X-ray. I'm telling you, Tyler, Jim, I had the most pain I've ever went through. I, I mean, I couldn't do anything. We go get the X-ray and they're like, oh yeah, you really broke it. I'm looking at Norwig like, 
why did I practice today? I should have <laughs> went and got this wrist. But back then, man, back then, man, you, you know, it was, you know, I was a rookie. I was a special team guy. And, you know, it was like, whatever, Rook. You, you're going to practice today and then we'll look at it. Now, if that was someone like Rod Woodson or Kevin Green or Greg Lloyd, they would have took special care. They would have flew a helicopter in Three River Stadium and got them to the hospital. But since I was just a rook, they were like, whatever, man, just practice. We'll check you out later. So you broke the uh, the scaphoid bone, is that, yeah. that right? Yeah, which is like a really hard bone to heal. Yeah. I was in a cast forever. I was in the cast to February. They did surgery, and I, I, I really played in the cast that, that following year, 93, when I became the starter. Yeah. I played in it for a little bit, and then I got what they call a wrist rocket. And I played with that wrist rocket for the rest of my career. It's unbelievable. I, I couldn't really bench press or anything. So it was – and my whole job is to shed, hit, and shed guys. So I'm thinking, yeah. like, how the hell am I going to play with this bad wrist? But – I got through it some kind of way. Man, and, and as you said, Greg, uh, he did not apologize, right? He did not apologize, no. <laughs> and I don't think he will ever apologize. Does it come up when you catch up with him? Do you, do you bring the story <laughs> yeah. up to him? All the time. All the time. And he just kind of like, uh, come on, LK. You know, Greg is a little bit more mellow now. Yeah. So it's just kind of funny having conversations with him. We actually drove to Kevin Green's funeral together. It was about a five-hour trip, man. We had a great conversation, calling different guys. Uh, it, it was, you know, a sad occasion, of course, but it was really good catching up with him, and he allowed me to stay in his house, man. It was cool. Right. Well, hey, it's sorry, Jim, if you want to hop in, you could hear these Greg Lloyd stories all day. I mean, Chad oh, Brown was saying how he, you know, he same thing in 93. He got lit up by Greg and said, hey, yeah, this is not how we practice around here. It's just yeah, different. Yeah, I mean, Greg would, like, We'd be doing a drill, and nobody wanted to go against Greg because he would go hard, man. <laughs> he would go hard. You're just like, man, can you chill out for a second? But now nah, that's just the way he did it. But he had he. I think he elevated the rest of us too. Yeah, yeah. We. I, I think we really. I think he was the guy that we we like our our defense, man. We were running heels after practice. I mean, we would do extra work. And a, a lot of times, and I think that's the reason why we were so good. We took a lot of pride and we took a lot of ownership and of being a Pittsburgh Steeler, especially being a linebacker. Like being a linebacker there, man, it's a, you got a lot to live up to there. I mean, the linebacker lineage is strong. The tradition is strong. And so, you know, I, when I went in there, playing inside linebacker. I just didn't want to let anybody down, man. So I, you know, I just played, but, you know, I came into my own. I realized that I was a really good player, um, even though I changed positions and it worked out for me. I, I think that was the best move for me to go in the inside and, and play. But yeah, man, G Lloyd and, and, and Kevin, what I always say, Kevin was the guy that helped me understand the game from a film pr uh, perspective. Jerry O was the guy who talked to me um, when I first got there and really kind of taught me how to play the position. He's still there, right? He's, an he's still coach. there. Yeah, he's a coach. Yeah. Yeah. He's still there. And uh, he does a, I mean, I, he does a good job with those guys. I mean, Jerry was always very smart, understood the game very well. Uh, it's kind of funny that he's a coach because Jerry O would, it will be like five minutes before we have to warm up. And Jerry O would just be walking in just be walking in the locker room. And we're like, Jerry, man, it's like five minutes. He never wore tape. He never wore ankle tape or wrist but uh, wrist tape. He just go out there and just play, man. Yeah. And he was ready to play. So um, they allowed it. But it was like everybody else needs to be there two hours or guys would be there three hours. Yeah. But not Jerry O. Jerry O would come in there like super late. And it's kind of funny how guys like that end up being coaches. Yeah, we should, Jerry Olsapsky, right? Unless yeah. I mispronounced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we should say that we're we're thinking of him too right now. Um, I believe he just lost his his yeah, wife. Yeah, he just lost his wife. I called him oh. the other. I called it called him when it happened because um, I'm not sure if you guys remember. I lost my wife about eight years ago. Oh my god. Uh, yeah, so I I definitely understood where he was coming from and just wanted to 
make sure I called them and tell them I was here for them. Man, I was thinking of you too. I I can't imagine going through something yeah. like that. Man, that's a tough deal. But um, but yeah, you know, just with with your team, your defense. I, I go back to maybe like what defense do you think was the best before we kind of get to today's Steelers? Like that 94 team to me, was it when he lost to San Diego, maybe in the conference championship game? I think we talked about that a little, that, that might've been the defense that was that really was special. Yeah. That, that was the, I thought that was our, our best team. Um, the defense, we were on point. We were just, I mean, we were just destroying the league. I think everybody on the starting defense had a sack. Everybody, cornerbacks, everything. Deion Figures had a sack. Rod, was, you know, well, Rod and Lake, they they always had, you know, they would always get like five or six sacks. And then you, Kevin, I think maybe had fourteen or he was double digits. I think Greg was double digits. Uh, Chad, Chad, to me, uh, Chad was a Chad was a like the ultimate cleanup guy, you know. And uh, the, we called it the Mac linebacker at the time. And Chad, did, we worked so well together. We were just like, you know, one of those wrestling tag teams that just really mess. <laughs> just really mess. And uh, it was kind of cool because we were, we we're, I mean, I'm one year older. And, you know, when you're talking about Greg and Kevin, man, we had to really kind of psych ourselves out too to, to even be on that level, to be on that field. So, yeah, that 94 team was um, indeed special. We had Ray, Ray Seals, Joe Steed, Riston Buckner. Started, he started as a rook. And uh, I think we had Lake, Carnell Lake, Dan Perry, Dion Figures, and Rod Wilson, of course. And then you got guys like, you know, Jason would come in. Keevan Henry would come in. Willie Williams would come in. <clears throat> so we had um, Bob Johnson would come in. So we had really had a really good team, really did. I mean, just guys who could fly around, really no weak links, you know, it was really nobody you can kind of pick on during that time. So, yeah, 94 was by far during my time the best defense we had. Man, I didn't – I mean, you had seven seasons of 100 tackles and over 1,000 for your career, right? And that Mm – all over the place. Um, Yeah. And, you know, I was kind (laughs) of – I was so unique in a lot of ways, you know, just being a big line, you know, a guy between that 260, 280 range. Yeah. But it was so, it was so funny though, because I worked as hard. I mean, like my job was playing the buck linebacker, stone linebacker was the hardest job on that team. It was the hardest because not only do you have to stop the run, but you're running about, 30, 40 yards down, you're carrying a guy right down the scene. So <laughs> my big self is running with tight ends. I'm I'm covering backs out of the backfield. Uh, you know, we got a blitz. Oh man, it was a tough job. It, <laughs> I'll be in practice, man. And I have ran mo- more than any linebacker on the team. I'm like, <laughs> the biggest guy on the team is running down down the field with tight ends. And then I have to come back, get in the huddle, call the signals, turn around, get everybody lined up. It, it was a job, man. I enjoy it, but <laughs> it was funny that I had to, like the biggest guy on the team is running, you know, along with these tight ends. Probably wanted to carry that kind of weight too, because I mean, you're going to pack a punch when you make contact. Unless, See, that's you, the, know? you know, that's the thing, man. The, the the weight worked for me. Yeah. It really did. It was more so, it was my advantage because, you know, I'm bigger than, uh, the unique thing about me was I was bigger than the fullbacks or anything like that, but I could run with running backs, tight ends. I was extremely, for my size, I probably had some of the best feet besides maybe like a Jerome Bettis. I had extremely, extremely quick feet. And I was more like a running back as far as my agility was concerned. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Jim, get get on in here, man. I we could talk Levon's ear off. No, I was always curious, Levon, was there ever, I was on some teams where the defense 
uh, I was director of personnel for the Bills, and our defense was really good, but our offense was not. Mm -hmm. um, was there ever any type of tension when you have a great defense? Did, did you ever was there ever tension with the offense? Like, did they ever feel pressure? Like, man, we're letting th these guys down. Did you guys ever have run-ins or arguments with the offense? Like, hey, we're holding up our end of the bargain. Are you guys? Uh, not a lot, but one year I think we did. Uh, it was, it was the year Cordell just had a, I mean, we changed offensive coordinators and Cordell was playing fantastic. Yeah. And then they wanted Cordell to kind of stay in the pocket and really not use what God gave him, you know, right. use his feet. I mean, the guy could, pa it wasn't that he couldn't pass the ball. He couldn't read coverages. It was that it took a while, you know, like, you know, back then, Quarterbacks didn't really come ready-made to play, and you had to play the system instead of instead. You know, Chan Gailey did a good job of adjusting to Cordell Stewart's um, skill set. Yes, and you know when Chan was there, Cordell played well. He really did. He led us to the ASC championship. Um, he had, he didn't have a great game that game. But I think when they try to force feed him to do some things, it didn't work out. And man, when you're on defense <laughs> and your offense can't score, it's the worst. So you get frustrated. You do. And I've sometimes you're just yeah. like, yo, hey, man, y'all need to pick it up, man, because we're dying out here. Yeah. And it's only, and you, and, and you only have a window of time in the NFL. Like, you know, right. you know that, hey, we got, you know, we have five years, six years to get this done. Like we're, we, we're good on this wow. side of the ball. Can you guys got, or you could look at the front office, the coaches, like, what are you guys doing? Like, you know, yeah, but that's cool to hear though, that you, you, you only had, you know, a little, that's, that's a good point about coaching though. And that's what Tyler and I were talking about. Like a mm -hmm. guy like Chan Gailey, that's refreshing to hear that like, comes in and like, Hey, I can win with this guy. Just use him this way. And right. That's coaching. I mean, that's coaching. That that is coaching. And uh, I remember Jim Hasley coming in, and you know, we he had to learn the defense, not so much us. <laughs> right. <laughs> he had to learn it because right. the three four was in place, and it wasn't exactly. going to change at all. So it was like, <laughs> I'm sorry, dude. Whatever you thought, whatever you brought here, your big notebooks and all that, you could toss that because we run the same defense we always run. So. Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, honestly, I think coaches do make a, a big difference, yeah. man. And I think, and, and the, okay, I'm going to be frank with you. There are some coaches that really probably don't belong in the NFL. They just don't belong in the NFL, man, because they, I don't know if they're cookie cutter or they're, I call them theory guys. You know, they draw it on the board and they, it, they swear it's going to work. <laughs> But man, we playing Barry Sanders, Tony <laughs> Tony Gonzalez. Man, they can out; <laughs> those guys can outskill your your plan, your theory. That's and you know that's why I like about Coach LeBeau. You know, we you know Coach LeBeau would ask us what's going on. You know what what you're seeing, and as players, you felt comfortable in saying like, "Hey, Coach, you know, so and so play, we shouldn't run that." It's not working. He'll just, he'll basically literally just kind of ball that up and throw it in the trash can. So, yeah, I think if you're a coach, you got to be able to, you got to be able to cater to your personnel as far as scheme is concerned. Understand what guys can and cannot do. A lot of times we would play cover two. And, you know, cover two is not that great against the run, but me and Joel Steed were so good against the run. So we'll play it. <laughs> You know, we'll play cover two on first down oh. against the run because they knew we could make up the difference. You got Rob Wilson out there. You don't need to be too exotic. <laughs> Just let them play, you know? And I, I think sometimes coaches get into their head when they're trying to outsmart the guy instead of, like, coaching the game and coaching the situation that's happening. They get caught up and – that's why you see guys do some stuff, you know, like uh, I was watching Lane Kiffin. They were going against Alabama, Ole Miss. And, you know, the, I guess, analytics said, hey, if it's fourth and something, go for it. And I'm like, but that's not the speed of the game. That's not the feel. Like, 
you're not going to get that fourth and two against Alabama running into the A gap. Not happening. Not happening. <laughs> now, just, just punt that thing, or you'd be better just trying to throw it. But, you know, analytics, it's just information. It's not, yeah. you take it with you, but you don't always apply it because it doesn't apply it in every situation. So I, I think when you have a coach, that's why I like, you know, like guys like Bill Cowher, guys like that. Um, Bruce Arians, those guys understand what's happening in the game. And, you know, everything doesn't work, but they do understand the game. And when you got coaches that understand the game and understand the personnel, you got to win in combination. We need names. Who are these terrible coaches we got to get out of the NFL, LeVon? Uh, I'm not going to say names. <laughs> I'm not going to say names. I'm not going to do that. But, you know, okay, well, I, you know, like, just for example, like, I played in a 3-4, right? I mean, I basically grew up in a 3-4. And when you got people telling you that, like, we used to do three-receiver hook, and maybe you know about this, Jim, a little bit, three-receiver hook, you, you get the final number three guy, right? If you're covering, the, the number three guy is your guy, and you count from the outside, one, two, three. But even number, the guy who starts off as number three may not end up as number three. So you have to kind of like see the pattern and like, okay, who's the final number three? That's your guy. It was real easy. And then you go to some places and they make it difficult. Like, why don't you just let, you know, they try to like the outside linebacker they wanted him to carry a tight end. Outside linebackers cannot cover. They cannot, they're not even <laughs> thinking about covering. They're no. thinking about sacking the quarterback, uh, making sure they're in place for a bootleg or a reverse, mm -hmm. and, and maybe getting to the scene flat. To ask them to carry a tight end, especially the tight ends that are in the league now, you're asking for it. And then when the back flares out, you want the guy who's supposed to be the number three receiver hook guy to flare out. And that guy already got an advantage of him. Just stuff like that. Just like, it, that doesn't make sense to me. And they'd be like, oh, yeah, blah, 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 <laughs> and blah, 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 blah. It's going to work. Look at it on the paper. And I'm like, man, I have been out on the field. <laughs> that paper, that theory football does not always work and you could draw it up i get that you could draw it up and you could be creative but you got to understand in the game it could be different and some coaches thinking like what is he doing he's not doing it right but hey man you got me covering <laughs> <laughs> you got me covering i remember one time i covered uh tony gonzalez man and i was in perfect position i was running side by side but this guy played basketball. He <laughs> he hit that vertical jump and he called it over my head. I went back to the sideline and I didn't feel bad. I was like, I don't know what you guys want me to do with this. <laughs> I, I just don't know. I mean, I I mean, even the commentator was like, LeVon Kirkland was in perfect position. And I mean, Tony just jumped over me. So yeah. those kind of players, they define the odds. They do. You could say you could tell me take an angle on Barry Sanders all you want to. That angle is sometimes not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. Like, hey, take half man away from him. Yeah, that may not work because that's Barry Sanders. <laughs> you know, when we play guys like Barry Sanders, you just like, hey man, it got to be a group effort. We all got to get to the ball because one on one, it was over. So you have those kind of matchups in the NFL and, you know, and you can go and you can draw it up all you want to, but especially during my time, I mean, my era, my era was like, it was a combination of like, dude, you better bring it because that other guy is going to bring it. And if you don't, you're going to get hurt. So it was the glory I, era in nice, the 90s. Yeah, the 90s. I was like, I was, I mean, I'm like the nicest guy, like, I probably was like one of the nicest guys on the team, but man, you go on that field, man, you have to, you have to turn it on. You have to be another guy. I can give y'all a story about that. It was 
I dated a girl, her name was Ebet, and she really didn't know football very much. So, uh, but she lived in Pittsburgh. I don't know if she was playing me, but I don't think she knew the game that much. So she goes to her first regular season game. I mean, she understands that I play and all that stuff, but, you know, she's very, very casual fan. So she goes to the game. And so we are, you know, after the game, we meet downstairs, get in my car, we're driving, about to go get something to eat. And she's like, so who's that number 99? And I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, yeah, like, who's that guy? I was like, that was me. She's like, "Mm -mm, it could not possibly be you. She's like, the LeVon, she's like, the the LeVon I'm dating is not that guy. She's like, oh my God, you were like hitting people. So she, (laughs) she was taken aback because I was so aggressive on the field. Yeah. And belligerence, just, you know? Yeah. She was like, who is that guy? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no, no, you know, I have to be that guy on the field. But, you know, I'm the guy you know off the field. So I just thought it was um, hilarious that she made that point. How do you get to that place then? I mean, are you. You put an ACDC into the year? Are you like meditating? Are you, you know, visualizing? How, how do you, I mean, we're talking to you here, like you said, nicest sky, reminisce. Yeah. How, do, how do you get to that dark, dark place on a Sunday? Oh, man. I tell you who put me there was um, Randall McDaniel. We played the preseason game. And I'm just, you know, my, my first year starting. And I kind of, it's a, it's a screenplay. And I kind of come up there kind of being a little bit, I, I guess, finesse. <laughs> I mean, he blew my ass back to the goal line almost. And I was like, damn that. I'm going to hit everybody before they hit me. So I got a lesson early. You know, that welcome to the NFL. He gave me that welcome to the NFL speech. I heard it and it stuck with me. And I was just like, damn, I don't care who it is. Offensive lineman, fullback, I'm going to get them before they get me. And so that was my mentality. I was like, I am going to get you way before you get me. Because if you didn't, you're going to get hurt. I mean, especially back then when, I mean, I don't want to be one of those guys that like, well, back in my day, but (laughs) I mean, it's a different game. And we were, I mean, it was a lot of, it was a lot of car crashes out there. Let me put it that way. And you wanted to be the car that was doing the crashing. Remember Greg (laughs) Lloyd and like, smashing Brett Favre in a preseason game, right? Like in 95? Yeah, man. <laughs> you, you wouldn't see that in a preseason game You can't game pretend today. in football. Like, you can't yeah. pretend. You know, because it will, I think, pretenders, it will call you out. Mm-hmm. Football is that game that if you ain't real, <laughs> the game will expose you for being non-real. You've seen a lot of players come in there and – They try to fake it. Are there first rounders can't miss guys in college? They come into the NFL. The the NFL game exposes bad players. It does, yeah. And if you're not a good player, you're not going to play that long. You're not. I I mean, I don't care how high you get drafted, whatever. You're not going to play that long because it's for the real deal dudes. It's for the one percenters. But I don't know. And, I thought Vince Williams made a good point where he said, you know, for the longest time, you had to be a tough guy to play, right? Like they're yeah. now it's with the rules and everything. I mean, you could just be really, really fast or you could jump really, really high. And you don't necessarily need to have gone through that attrition to get to the NFL. I Do you agree with that? Or do you still think it's that uh, way? I think so in a way you have, I mean, I think so in a way that the, the, the NFL is different where, you know, quarterbacks can play to their 40s. I bet you back then they couldn't play to their 40s, 40 years old, because they took away the art of defense. And what I mean by the art of defense, um, the art of defense is not really always getting a sack, but hitting the quarterback when he delivered the ball. That says a message from his pre-court text that them dudes coming. And I better, you know, I better be aware. So now you're not just sitting back there just being comfortable and throwing a ball all over the place because you got guys that even though they may not get to you in time, they still get to you in time by giving you a little lick after the play. Yeah. 
So if a wide receiver want to come across the middle on a shallow route, oh, he's going to pay the he's going to pay the price. He's going to pay the toll. You're going to try to knock him back to the offensive line of scrimmage, and now he's going to be like, you know what? I'm not trying to catch that ball down the middle. I, I'm not going across. Or you you going for a post, and that safety is waiting for you to try to catch that ball, and you get knocked out. That wide receiver is like, nah, you know, <laughs> I don't know if I want to run that route. Now they know they're not going to really get hit. Yeah. And that's taken away. I mean, the tough part about the game has been taken away. I, I, I really believe that the art of the defense has been, has been taken away. That's why offenses are scoring so much. That's why the quarterbacks sit back there and just massage the ball because they know they can't get hit you touch them now in the game, you know, um, oh you're going to get a penalty. So it works for them. Yeah. It's, so that's why you can be fat because you're not going to get hit. In the 90s, though, buckle your chin straps because we're coming after you. And then we might just hit you just to kind of say, you know, like, um, yeah, we've been hearing about what you've been saying. We, we see how good you're supposed to be. Take this lick with you and see how good you're going to be after that. Yeah. You know, LeVon, we talk about it's become really hard to officiate the game. The way the rules are set up, yeah. it, the officials are being, I mean, they're forced to call some of this play because this is how it's set up now. I don't even know. It's hard to watch. It's really become hard to watch. It, it's tougher to watch. I think tougher. It, that's a good way to say it. Tougher to it's watch. It's tougher to watch. I mean, because, you know, nowadays, only thing a, a receiver got to do is pretend he's throwing a flag. And the referee's like, oh, yeah, oh. that probably should be a flag. Here it is. Yeah. Yeah. And that as happens. Defender, you see it. Yeah. Yeah. As a defender, I have the right to the ball, too. I have the right to the ball. So the receiver is the only one who has a right to the ball. So if we tussling, I mean, it's, it's going to go against me. Right. That, he's pushing, too. You know, so the game is kind of – they went a little overboard as far oh, as slanting the game to the offense. Yeah. Now, on defense, it's, it's hard to it's hard to coach defense, man. It's hard to play defense. It's, it's hard because you can't do the, some of the stuff that when I mean, you're reacting the whole time. I, I tell people this all the time on defense, yeah. man. It's energy. It's energy. Where offense, they kind of know where they're going to, so it's a good. It can be a good pace. But for a defender, I got to see it, and I got to react to it. That's more energy. Yeah, true. That's more energy. Yeah. And so if I'm, you know, if it's harder for me to play defense, back in the day, you can do things that kind of would eliminate some of the hardness. Like, guys don't even touch the tight ends anymore. Like, these tight ends are making numbers, but – they're not even getting jammed anymore. That's because they're receivers now. They're not yeah. even tight ends how you remember them. Right. Yeah. They just they just, <laughs> guys just open, they just open the door for them and like yeah yeah catch the ball. Why don't right. you go ahead and catch the ball on them? Yeah, I'm just gonna let you do that. So I mean, I mean that, yeah, that's it's a different that's a different ball game. It's it's different. The Green Bay Cincy game at the I mean all those crazy missed kicks. That's what we're gonna remember. But the play that set up the game winner. Is exactly this art of defense that you're talking about. I mean, Rodgers is under pressure. He backpedals. He kind of floats one over to mid, over the middle to Randall Cobb. I mean, it is a throw that if a quarterback attempted it in the '90s, I mean, you <laughs> he'd be in trouble. Like he'd have to he'd have some explaining to do. But Randall Cobb can kind of just catch it because he he got hit. But if it's the if it's 1996, I mean, he's getting absolutely blasted. And defenders, yeah. they, they know they can't do it. They just can't. So he catches it. Yeah. Mason Crosby finally makes the field goal. Green Bay wins. Right. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they and, and like you said, they know that. They know that. They know that, you know what, I'm not going to really get hit. Uh, quarterbacks understand that as well. Right. I'm not going to get hit. Let me throw it. They're going to either call pass interference or something. It's going to work in our, it's going to work in our favor. So, yeah, I mean, it's kind of a shame because to me, the our era was so much fun. And it was a it was man to man. Uh, 
can you beat me? Can you beat me one-on-one? But then after the game, it was mad respect for the guy you played against. You know, it was, it wasn't one of those like man hugs. You see, it was an embrace. Like, dude, you brought it today, man. Like it was, um, it was craziness. So yeah, I, 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 I enjoyed my time in the NFL. I really did. And, you know, especially playing with Pittsburgh Steelers and they love defense, man. They love the linebackers. So it was a really good time to play. And you could, I mean, you could intimidate guys. You could. You could intimidate guys. Um, you know, I love I love hitting the fullbacks. Any kind of isolation or whatever like that, I love take. I would love hitting those guys. Oh, you and Howard Griffin had some battles. I mean, he won one, me he won Howard, one. Uh, me and Howard Griffin had some battles. But the guy that I really had a battle with, believe it or not, I don't know if you remember him, but Sam, is it Sam Gash or is Cash? Gash, absolutely, yeah. Now, me and Sam Gash had some battles, yeah. like epic battles, where if we played well, when he played with uh, Baltimore or Buffalo, guys would be like, man, watch Kirk and watch Sam. We would. I hated, I hated playing against him. But I, I had to play my best. I had to play my best game. Because <clears throat> sometimes you meet a guy, and sometimes you can, you know, there's some guys you can meet and you can intimidate. Mm-hmm. You can, you're better than them. Then there's some guys, they're better than you. But then that's that guy. And you guys are almost the same. You're not going to back down. You're going to bring it every single time. And after the game, me and him would just embrace. Mm-hmm. Because it was a tough day in the office. It was... It was one of those games that it was just like, whew, glad this one's over with, man. This was a tough one. Survived. <laughs> it was. <laughs> we survived. I mean, because we, I'm telling you, man, it was like the coaches knew. And they're just like, let's run an isolation just to see LeVon Kirkland and Sam Gass go after it. And you see it developing, that guard blocking down, tackle blocking out. He does that little hop step. I'm like, here it comes. Ooh, bam. And... We'd be doing that all game long. <laughs> a few, a few concussions mixed in there along the way, I'd imagine. Oh, uh, man. It was – I hit him one time. He ran a little angle route, and I hit him, and I blew him up. Man, my show – I got one of those stingers, man. Oh. And I just – if you ever get a stinger, uh, you can't talk. <laughs> no. You walk off, man, and you're just holding your shoulder a certain way, and you can't even speak. <laughs> but – that's the kind of battle me and Sam would have. So, yeah, but, and then me and Howard, man, but I got Howard so good one time. Yeah. That he actually, I, I sat him down. Yeah. I hit him so hard that he kind of just kind of sat down. <laughs> and I think it was, um, it was, it was a regular season game and it bothered him. Mm-hmm. It bothered him so much because Howard was really competitive. It bothered him. I knew I got him too. I mean, he kind of went in there and I, I sat him down and Earl Holmes started talking so much junk to him because of something I did. Nothing that Earl did, <laughs> something I did. I didn't really, I didn't even talk junk at him. I just hit the guy and I'm telling you, man, he was, um, so we play him in the AFC championship game and boy, he didn't try to get, he didn't try to go man to man ever again. He was always trying to cut me. And I told him, and I, I think it was called, uh, it was a, the America's game or whatever like that. He said, football, you know, yeah. oh yeah, America's game. Yeah, he was right. talking about yeah, my yeah. size and he was saying like, you know, I was like, they're talking about why you got to cut me. I didn't say that. This is what I said. I said, yeah, you better cut me. That's the only <laughs> way you can block me. I was like, you better cut me. So I was like, yeah, I understand why you cut me. But he was like, he, 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 and I mean, I guess he has the last word except for you guys. He was like, oh, you got to cut me. You got, I didn't say that. I was like, you better cut me. I, you know, I, with my size and stuff, I was surprised most guys didn't try to cut me. You better cut me because you knew like one-on-one, it wasn't happening. I was going to bust you up for, I would say 90% of the times. I might've got gotten a couple times, but not very often. Um, 
I might not have been like a Hall of Famer, but I guarantee you everybody in my era remember who I was. So it was fun. It was a lot of fun. Then. Well, Thank we got to write history then, right? So we, we yeah. you sat Howard down, blasted him, and now we, we yeah. were able to kind of clean it up there for NFL and they films. Changed, and really, they changed that blocking scheme, too. They started putting a lineman on him uh, instead of Howard because he got blasted. And I think it was more than once. But the one time I got him, I mean, he falls back, and he sits down first. Okay. And then he falls back. And Earl was like, sit down, clown. He's like, Kurt, <laughs> Earl was like my hype man. Kurt, he was like, Kurt owns you. Kurt owns you. And, and to hear him talk about that, because it bothered him. Yeah. You can tell like, watching that, it bothered him. If like, you watch it, it bothered him. Yeah. And I just kind of laugh because he was just like, all I could think about. <laughs> Revi- yeah, right. Got a kind of mi- a little myth making in those uh, yeah, docs, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But you never saw him just dominate me or beat me down. No. It, it wasn't like that. But I, I respect Howard. I thought Howard was a really good fullback. Man, I mean, Levon, you've been you've been amazing. So we, we've kept you way longer. But uh, before we lose you too, we got to get your take on the Steelers today, like. We, we spent a little time on them uh, at the start of the podcast. It's I, I, even though the game has kind of changed, I, I still feel like everything that you guys kind of built in the nineties is, is living on through Mike Tomlin and what they're trying to do on defense. It is still different there. I mean, it's the practices they still hit they're, they're, The language used is, is still, you, you've got echoes of the nineties. Sure. I don't know. I, I think I, I kind of put my trust into Mike Tomlin into the Steelers to figure this out, even as Ben kind of fades away, but it, it hasn't really been pretty on offense, especially what, what, what do you make of this franchise right now? Ooh, uh, I think you kind of summed it up a little bit. I, I think that they struggle on offense and that struggle begins with uh, Ben. He's what Ben was really good at. He can't really do it anymore. You know, Ben can hold that ball. He can fight guys off. He can scramble. I mean, he can throw the ball. I mean, Ben, I mean, like, I mean, he's an amazing quarterback. He's just not the guy he was. And so they're trying to make him into a guy that throws the ball quick. Teams catch on to that. They do. They can be like, oh, Cincinnati last year caught on to it. Like, you know what? We just got to jam their wide receivers. Don't let them off the line of scrimmage. And stop being from the quick throw because they couldn't really throw it down field and they couldn't run the ball. They run the ball a little better, but they're not great at running the ball. If you look at the history of the Pittsburgh Steelers, they, they have always been able to run the ball because you know why? Because in um, when playoff time comes, running the ball works. <laughs> you got to be able to run the ball and you got to be able to play defense. You do because your offense is. Not as good, I don't think. I don't think your offense going to the playoffs, you know, they're probably not hitting their stride. You know what I'm saying? But if you got a great defense and you can run the ball, most likely you're going to win. I, I think it starts with Ben. I, I know they got some new guys on offense. I think they're, I think they got the running back. I think they got some good wide receivers that could, you know, could definitely help them take it to the next level. But I think you got to start thinking about that quarterback. And what are you going to do there? And if you don't think Mason Rudolph, um, Haskins are the answer, you got to start looking for one. Maybe it's a – I don't see why they're not in the – well, I know why they're not in the Deshaun Watson sweepstakes because he got too much baggage. Mm -hmm. You can't come to – I'm going to tell you, you may – the one thing about the Steelers, you cannot come there with a lot of baggage. You may get some baggage while you're there and – that can only last for a second. That's not going to last. With the Roonies, yeah, you're, you're going to be a solid citizen. You're going to be a solid, because if you're not a solid citizen, it depends. If you're a really good player, they kind of tolerate you, but then they get to the point like, you know what? We're not going to tolerate you. Where most teams would kind of like, it's okay. <laughs> He's one of our best players. We got to keep him. Yeah. You know, that's just not the way with the Steelers. But anyway, I, I think Ben may be the issue there. He's, you know, he's just not the same guy. And he was, I mean, he's going to the Hall of Fame. He's an incredible player. Uh, that 
that Super Bowl they played in Arizona. What well, was no, it wasn't Arizona in Tampa when he threw that pass. Oh my gosh, that was probably one of the best drives you ever see. And that was probably one of the best passes you, to to Holmes. You can't get any better than that pass. No, no. That was probably one of the best passes I would dare say in Super Bowl history. That mm-hmm. really doesn't get talked about. You're right. I, it doesn't. No, it's in, that that pass was like. I mean, they talk about the Eli passes, you know, that one, you know. Sticking the helmets. <laughs> but, I mean, like, you're telling me that that pass that Ben Roethlisberger threw is not the best pass in Super Bowl history? When you're driving down, the game is on the line, you're behind, and he drives them all the way down with a bad offensive line and throws a perfect strike. And the Holmes catch might be one of the best catches, too. Yeah, but I, I think the issue is, is Ben, and um, they know it, you know. But when you get a when you have a Hall of Fame quarterback, man, it's hard to let him go. Yeah, it's hard to let him go, because you always think he has a puncher's chance. It's like when remember when Mike Tyson came back. Yeah, you, you know, going against yeah. Dennis, you just like, well, it's Mike Tyson. He has a chance. You know, he has a puncher's chance. And I think sometimes that's been. Yeah. It, it, or any great player, you just think they got a puncher's chance because right. they've been so great. But Father Time is like, I'm undefeated, baby. You go, you're going to give it up at some point in time. I mean, do they just go to Mason Rudolph then? I mean, what, what do they do? Because that, that would be my point is like, what, what would you have done even as far back as March? I mean, there weren't really, if you don't think, that the option is there to transition to, you know what, trot them out there for one more year, make a run at Rogers or somebody in 2022. I, I don't know. I think that, I think the run at Rogers would, Oh my God. If, you, if Pittsburgh got Aaron Rodgers, it is over baby. <laughs> or if they really want to be set up, you trade for Jordan love, right? I mean, we're a love friendly <laughs> podcast. If you really want to go all in, no, that's a secret about love. And I know that's a secret. You can't play. <laughs> oh, Ron. Oh. All right. You know, we're we're, we're going to have to get really, you out of here. I, don't, I can't say that. I don't really know. <laughs> but I can't really say that. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't know what they're going to do. I, I'm, you know, because I don't think anybody's coming out next year. Right. There, there's no big-time guys coming out next year, I don't think. It's gonna have you can to tell be... me about that quarterback from North Carolina all you want to. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Hey, you you're not, you're not bringing out. I mean, last year, man, that was the, that was the, if you were going to get a quarterback, that was the year. The Trevor Lawrence. I mean, I mean, uh, Justin Fields. Mm-hmm. Uh, those guys. The, I think those young guys are all going to be good. They're going to all be good. I don't know if you got guys coming out this year that's going to be really, you know. Can you say first round Hall of Fame? Because I look at it, and you tell me, uh, Jim, your first rounder almost should be like he's going to the Hall of Fame. Yeah, I mean, we always in those first first couple of picks, you're thinking Hall of Fame guy. We would stress we we might not say Hall of Fame, but you don't want any question. You want him to come in, start, and you didn't question the pick, right? right? But one thing I know is guys know on the team. I, I, any team I've been with, and we would draft somebody in the first round. We took a defensive tackle in New Orleans, Cedric Ellis from USC, short and right. stocky little guy. Yeah. And we had some big guards, Jiree Evans, Carl Nix were our guards. And after that first time they went against him, they're all looking at us like, nah, he ain't the answer. Like, you guys missed. The players, players, tell, players could tell right away. Like, players, it's so funny, Tyler. You know. You know, especially those like, first rounders. You guys are watching those first rounders. Like, we know right away. Right like, away. Like, there. I mean, honestly, you know, it, I don't know if it's like a, I guess, you know, it's just like anything. You, if you work somewhere, you kind of know if someone else is good, right? And you know when somebody else is bad. Yeah. I'm telling you, as a, when, I, when we I, play, you can almost sniff who's good and who's not. You'll be yeah. like, he can play. He can't play. 
He can play. Oh, that, that little guy's pretty good. Mm-hmm. That's how you do it. You'd be like, oh, yeah, like when Willie Williams, I can tell you a guy, Willie Williams. When Willie Williams came on the team, and Willie's not a tall guy, but he's a rocked up guy. And we were all saying, oh, that little dude can play. That little guy can play, man. Like, or when Yancey Thigpen came to the, the team, Yancey Thigpen, like, I don't know what San Diego did, but we were like, who is this guy? <laughs> this guy is damn good. And so, you know, and like when I came on the team with Huey Richardson was on the team, I was like, this guy can't play. Yeah. I can't play. This is so, you know, you I, just I know. don't know how, you know, but you just, I guess because you, you're a player. So, you know what another yeah. player looks like, feels like, smells like. So, mm-hmm. you know, you did. Yeah. They I'm should going- consult the players sometime and be like, <laughs> Can this guy play? And a, a player just t- well, yeah, no. You know, if he can't play, they'll be like, they won't throw him under the bus. Some guys won't. They'll be like, mm, yeah, well, yeah. He, he, yeah, he okay. He okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If he can play, they're going to be like, oh, yeah, he's going to be a player. Even if he's not there yet, they can say like, oh, yeah, that guy, that guy's a player. When I saw Cordell Stewart, oh. he, I'm telling you, man, he got he got he was on the scout team at wide receiver. Tyler, Jim, Cordell Stewart was eating us alive in really? practice. Oh my God. Cordell, I'm telling you, you know, Cordell Stewart, if Cordell wanted to play wide receiver, mm-hmm. he would have been one of the best wide receivers ever played. Cordell Stewart was that good. He was that he was but Cordell Stewart honestly was before his time. Like if Cordell Stewart was getting drafted now, number one pick, no doubt about it. He'd be number one. I think we got him like second round or something like that. He was so good that Dick LeBow, I think they either Dick LeBow or Bill Carr was like, we got to play this guy. We you got to get him on the field some kind of way. Because he was absolutely giving us the business every day in practice that's 95 96 that's when your defense yeah, is, that's is, is when humming. we were collectively excellent on defense and he was giving it to us we could not stop that guy so really i mean when you went from chan gailey to ray sherman i mean you're in the afc championship game in 97 you go seven and nine and 98 if you had a system that really embraced cordell stewart you know obviously if he's in today's game probably a pro bowler, right? I mean, he's getting used the right way. He's doing whatever you want schematically, but it just goes to show, I mean, if he had the right situation around him, we're, we're thinking about Cordell Stewart in a totally different way. I mean, how, how great could he be even been at quarterback? Uh, yeah, uh, Cordell could do, he could have done what, I mean, honestly, I think Cordell kind of lost confidence a little bit. Um, I think back then, though, it's just, I mean, let's be frank for a black quarterback, man, it was just not a friendly time. Uh, and, you know, people start getting into your head. Yeah. And they start saying that you're not a quarterback, you can't play. So what you try to do? You try to prove to yourself you're a quarterback, so you're going to sit in the pocket, and it's really not your thing just yet because, you mm-hmm. you know, you don't know all the ins and outs. So they want to put you, I mean, they, you know, they label you. But the one thing I never got that I was like, I hated playing against guys who just, who, who can do it all. Like um, Mark Brunel, Steve Young, you telling me you'd rather play against a quarterback who can just stand in the pocket rather than a guy who can throw and run. Cause it's third and 15 and you drop back in the coverage, especially if it's man to man and he takes off and get that 15 yards. You're like, damn it. You got to play another set of downs. Yeah. I, in Pittsburgh, it was kind of funny. Our whole motto was like three and out. We wanted to get off the field. It was funny. It was like, let's get off this field. That's how we saw it. We saw it like, we're trying to get out of here in three plays or less. Yeah. You know, if we have to do six plays, okay. But we're trying to get off the field, you know, early. Because, I mean, you know, you play defense all day and wear you out. But, yeah, I mean, like with Cordell, man, I think uh, I think if Chan would have stayed there, man, it would have it worked out. Yeah, yeah. It would have worked out. Because he had 
he has something that a lot of other quarterbacks didn't have. Instead of just saying, like, let's look what he can do and let's cater to him instead of, like, this is the system we run, learn it or you're done. Right. I mean, it's it's nuts. If he was embraced with that defense, we're, we're talking to a uh, two or three times Super Bowl champ right now. No probably. question about it. Yeah. I have a ring. Sorry Instead to bring of that up. Being a footnote in the league, we would have we would have ring. No, not a footnote, man. You guys changed it. You changed <laughs> changed the game. And we, hey, Levon, cannot thank you enough for hanging out oh, with man. us for an hour. That was that was you fantastic. Guys are amazingly fun. <laughs> hey, you're welcome back anytime, man. You give us oh, the word. Thank you. Appreciate that was awesome. it. Appreciate it. Awesome. You, you, you know what? I had more personality than that was. <laughs> Like my teammates, they always thought like, man, Kirk is out of his mind sometimes. <laughs> but I love yeah. it. I love these stories. These are great. Oh yeah, man. I, I think that the stories are the, the best about it. Yeah. They're the best. And I, I think that's what you miss the most when you play. It's just hanging out with those yeah. bunch of guys, man. It's just because really? it's so much laughter, it's so much joy. And you're doing something that you love to do. So it's easy to come to work. But yeah, that's the thing we miss. I miss, I miss hanging out with Chad and Greg and Kevin, man. You know, some of the other guys like Princeton Buckner, man. I mean, it was it was amazing back then. So, where can people find you, Levon? Where can they listen to your podcast? I, I'm, I'm on Facebook. I think my I, I'm on Twitter too. But I always kind of like, what's my Twitter handle again? I think it's Levon Kirkland uh, underscore forty four or something like that. Yeah, you, you right. find me on Twitter. Just just look for me. Well, it's good to not live in that Twitter world, man. That's you're you're living in the real world. That's even yeah, better. I, well, they might get rid of Facebook pretty soon. <laughs> if That'd it keeps good. going the way, yeah, Facebook might be next. Well, by the time uh, Jim and I, you know, when our kids are, you know, teenagers, I'm just hoping all this stuff is just no more, right, and <laughs> just all gone, or else our kids are going to yeah, live in I, bubbles. They're going to do it a different way. Yeah, it's going to be like <laughs> it's going to be a way where you talk, your words will come out. Oh God, oh man. That's what's going to be next. <laughs> you can well, just speak in the air and just text it to whoever. Well, there, yeah, there's no uh, personal versus – or private versus public life anymore. Everything's just out there. Everybody right? is Everything's author, out there. Man. And yeah. everybody is kind of like a, a reader, you know? And people – it's funny when people like – and especially because I'm going back to school now. People are like, well, I did my research. <laughs> Like, really? <laughs> you went online <laughs> and you Googled it one time and you saw what you like and what agreed yeah. with your opinion. And yeah. now you're going to try to tell, you're going to try to school me. <laughs> yeah. I think it's hilarious. Read the Wikipedia page, right? That was yeah, good yeah, enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they act like it. And it's so funny because they act like they know, they knew that all the time, all along. I knew that. No, you did. You just kind of did a little <laughs> quick start. I get it now. I understand. Awesome. Well, let's do it again, Levon. Thanks so much, All right, man. Jim. All right, Jim. You guys take care. Thanks, Levon. Nice to meet you. Yeah, man. You too. See you, man.